We're good to go. What's up, everybody? What's up, everybody? How are you? Go. I mean, you got to at least start it. Yeah, you want me? Right? You want me roll it? All right. So, uh, <laughs> welcome back to Rule of Two. Today, we have a very special guest, Roger Christian, who has been all over the movie scene, uh, including mainly Star Wars and Alien, and he's been pretty much there since the literal inception of it. And we're here to talk to him about all of his experiences, answer some fan questions, and of course promote his book, which I've linked down below in the description on Amazon, and you can find it at any bookstore that you walk into. So, hey, Roger, how's it going? Hi, nice to be here. Nice to meet you. We're awesome, excited to Roger. talk to you. Yeah, man, we're pumped. We're pumped. So, uh, Roger, I'll I'll kick it off, and we kick this pretty much. We ask everybody that comes on the show this question: um, How was it the first time you met George Lucas, and do you have any kind of story about that? I was in Mexico in Wymus, um building sets for a lucky lady. And um, he'd, he'd finally got, hadn't got finance, he got promise of finance from Fox and it was decreed that it was half the cost in London. So, and there were the stages available in London to make it, which they weren't in LA. So uh, Gloria and Willard Hike, who wrote American Graffiti for him, wrote uh, Lucky Lady, and they became big friends of John Barry and I, the designer. So uh, they said, you better go down and meet these two because they're doing what you want, dusty old kind of rum running sets from the 20s and adapting Mexican buildings. So he came down and um, I was shoveling salt in a salt factory. And George turns up and um, we had a conversation about science fiction, at which point I said, you know, I'm not connected to anything so far. I see ships like dripping oil and looking like old and repaired. And he said, well, that's what I'm trying to make. And uh, we found out later in uh, lunch with John Barry, the designer at Alice's Restaurant, we were hired to make Star Wars and told to be in London on August the 1st. And uh, we worked four months with George, just three of us. There was the, the Fox hadn't greened at the movie. We had no money. We were borrowing bits and pieces to make things with. Right. And Fox only greenlit the movie when the budget was controlled and got down on uh, December the 22nd. So we have four months with George on and off. That's how it all started. And then from there, you moved on to Return of the Jedi and Phantom Menace and uh, you worked very closely on uh, the both Return of the Jedi and Phantom Menace were some of my favorite films so for Star Wars. And then you also worked on Alien, so I don't want to leave that out. So <laughs> please, yeah. please tell us about that process, too. We'll, we'll go into everything. Well, it, I um, at the end of Star Wars, I, th I was on the final remake of Beaugest immediately. I, I left the set and went on a plane to Spain and came back and went straight on to Alien, which Ridley wanted more kind of old and used for the Nostromo, like he wanted it. His description to me was a space truck. And I knew Ridley, I'd done commercials for him and uh, all sorts of stuff. So in fact, Life of Brian, I was designing with Terry Gilliam. I went straight on that. And then the financier read the script and banned it immediately and said, this is blasphemous. I'm not doing that. <laughs> And I was in the producer. The this one. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah. So um, I was in the producer's office while they were telling me, look, we're going to get the money somehow, but um, we're going to have to break. And Ridley called me that afternoon and said, get your backside down here to Shepard and I need you. Because yeah. I trained the crew and we'd done what I did with scrap and old junk to make really the Millennium Falcon interiors. Right. Wow. So they just set me to work, and I built a corridor for um, – he had to screen test Sigourney Weaver because obviously the studio wanted – the usual wanted a star, and he wanted Sigourney. And so rather than doing a screen test with a pot, potted plant, you know, and a white wall, he said, let's build a piece of the corridor. So I built a piece of the corridor for him, and that, that's actually on YouTube. You can see the origins of it. Oh, cool. And um, I, I just – I bought tons more scrap and <laughs> junk and everything. I, it, there's a there's a book on the making of Alien where the headline from me saying it was a monster of coordination because again, it because it was the first R-rated science fiction film. Mm. Fox were really nervous, so yeah. they cut our budget six hundred thousand a few weeks before shooting. They just cut it out, so it was 
really tough to make. But um, for me, I, I, I feel I got that one right, <laughs> everything. And, yeah. yeah. And, and did you um so so to take it back to Star Wars um because you know there's so many questions I have about that process with the original film and and one of those questions revolves around what I think is probably the greatest single relic prop you know item whatever you want to call it thing that's ever come out of cinematic history which is the lightsaber the lightsaber course. yeah. Yeah, so so can you tell me a little bit about the inception of the lightsaber? Some some kind of behind the scenes stuff that you know guys like us just would never ever know about. Yeah, and, and just apart from the book, now I'm just in the final editing on a um, documentary. Mm, awesome. On my work, it's called Galaxy Built on Hope because oh, nice. I was labeled cool. a galaxy major and we were crossing our fingers like this every day hoping it would work because we had no money to make Star Wars. But um, I, when I read the script, I kind of read it and they asked one of the journalists in the, in the documentaries asking me what came into your mind and I just said Excalibur, you know, when you think yeah. of story of King Arthur you don't think of King Arthur you think of this sword Excalibur and I realized if 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 Star Wars worked this would be the kind of emblem of it and I made this decision a because I wanted a used universe so I used found objects for all the weapons everything I didn't um, and just to tell you when Fox Green lit the film we were sh went into Elstree when the cruise came on with finance on January the 6th, we were shooting at the end of March. Mm. And that was to make robots, sand crawlers, lightsabers, weapons. I mean, it was insane. And uh, most science fiction films have nine months. We had two because everything had to truck down by. So I was adapting guns, real guns, because that was my big thing that I hated science fiction guns mm -hmm. um, because they went beep and looked light and I, I wanted real guns that could shoot and fire so that the lightsaber eluded me and I, I used my instinct and my offices were filled with junk and props and broken cameras I mean anything I could find I was collecting and I handmade Luke's binoculars and I wanted to have them look like binoculars at the end i used three different camera parts and stuck them this was all super glue by the way because <laughs> i did everything in my office um so i thought you know what i better put two lenses on the front so the audience knows what it is so i went to the camera hire place i just said to the uh, manager there, David French, do you have anything that I could use, like a handle or something interesting? And he pointed me to some boxes under a shelf that hadn't been open, I think, for 10 years. I pulled it out, and there were the Graflex handles. I just took one and thought, wow, I don't even have to do anything to this. Oh, <laughs> I found David. I've interviewed him about this whole thing of these um, for the documentary, because no one ever knows about him. And so I raced to the studios. I'd had some tea strip that I'd put round the uh, barrel of the Sterling submachine gun. To everything I changed slightly, twenty percent, just to give it a Star Wars look. Right. And um, so I stuck it round the handle. I I'd broken down a Texas Instruments calculator, and the bubble strip that illuminated the numbers and magnify them so you could read them that fit perfectly in the clip so i put that on put some chrome tape around the the graflex name and um called george over and said i think i found the lightsaber oh, wow. wow and he came into the office and george he just smiled and held it that's it that's he said the, that's it that was it he didn't say anything no, he didn't say anything he just smiled and held it because it was heavy and it just looked right and then the only thing he asked for was a d-ring on the end because yeah it wasn't used in tunisia but it was hanging on his belt so and this was luke's saber that was the first one you that's made luke's oh, saber okay. yeah I'm still, ups I'm still upset about Empire Strikes Back because the set deck I know he was better at doing period films and stuff he for some reason stuck rivets around the tea strip yeah. and I am still hurt by that I, I always wondered why did they change it 
What was I, the, you know? I, who knows why? The, he, he, I think he was too lazy to go and absolutely look at what I did and why. And literally, I know mine was stuck with super glue, but <laughs> I, I, it worked, <laughs> you know? So the rivets are man made. You know, this is a mystical object of a Jedi. This is something that should not have anything that you would recognize that, oh, that was made in the prop department. So unfortunately, that one is the one that's carried right through. But in the documentary, I'm, I'm explaining that very carefully. If you want Luke's really original lightsaber, that's the one from A New Hope. Yeah. And we're and the, we're going to flash the book again. Mark, go ahead with your question. I'm just going to flash the book again for everyone to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The there's, stories are in there. There's the saber. Look, that's the saber that I think of as Anakin's saber and Luke's saber, which, of course, you guys never really thought about it back then, as I've been told by folks on the inside, as Anakin's saber, right? It was actually, it was Anakin's saber all along because it was the saber of yeah. his father that he handed it well, down. We call them laser swords. <laughs> right, right. Laser swords. So, we're so, like, like Anakin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Is that a laser sword? Yeah. How, how, how did you? How did you? So, what was the process then for Darth Vader's laser sword? Was it easier now that you already had uh, Luke's already kind of built? So now you had to make some decisions on how to make uh, Darth Vader's saber a little bit different. What was that process like? Yeah, because when you look Obi Wan's saber, we used a piece of a Rolls Royce engine and a, and a hand, and a grenade piece. What? I used a grenade piece on it. If you look at Anakin's, it's got a grenade and, and a piece of a Rolls Royce engine inside. So what I thought was, <laughs> wait, awesome. he's say that again. I, I was changing the title to interviewing the creator of the lightsaber, <laughs> whatever it was before, because I feel like it's much more of a catchy There's phrase. A and get more people. Roll, it's a Rolls Royce. I think it's a Merlin engine from a Rolls Royce jet engine in there. For and who? There's for a who's lightsaber lightsaber? for Obi Wan's. Obi-Wan Kenobi's because I thought, okay, here's Luke's. So Obi-Wan's has to be ancient. He's an ancient mystic. He's like Merlin. So he's yeah, had yeah. an older look, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you've got Darth Vader, who obviously they've built a Death Star. They're the, they're the huge technical giants who are fighting these, you know, desert people who are the kind of organic nature, and these are the cold. So Darth Vader's has that cold clinical kind of look built yep. about it that's mm. that's how i kind of gauged each one of them for the characters and the sorry to get so damn geeky about this but okay <laughs> that's the point in, mark in darth vader's <laughs> hilt and i don't know if you can bring up a picture of it theory but darth vader's I'll, hilt i'll find some the top of it was like black plastic or right. polyurethane like what did you did you mold the top piece or was it also found? That piece the special effects boys did because it, in each of these we had to put a motor, which they did, a revolving motor, because I came up with the idea of these wooden sticks in them to give them to, to get the rotoscoping thing right. Yeah, because there was no way to do it, obviously. So I I, I was doing um I was doing art installations and we were using front projection paint and that was um uh, it used to glow in the art installation so i came up with this idea of them and then the special effects head had a clever idea he set the motor off center so it vibrated um and so his then went over to the special effects boys to put the top so on that top piece as far as I remember, and these are what few of the things that I cover <laughs> most of it, they made that piece for it. If you look at it, you see? Yeah, it's like a custom piece. Yeah. But it may this have been the, I think this is the that they had. This is the Empire Strikes Back one. We didn't get to yeah. see his in A New Hope. No. So you're talking about this one? And, and it's interesting. He has the same bubble tape that Luke had in Episode 4. Yes. But yeah. what do you mean we didn't get to see it when he fights Obi Wan? We 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 get a we get. Oh a yeah, never mind. We did. Yeah, 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 a little bit. Mind. Yeah, there's the new hope. Yeah, it wouldn't stick more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can um, see the head of it. So I think this piece here, but it may have come from something they had. You know, they they had so much stuff in their workshops. And and working, I mean, you have such an incredible 
like interesting career because you got to work with um you know the 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 artwork of 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 Ralph you know McQuarrie and of Geiger with Alien yes. like what what was it like adapting these two geniuses kind of illustrate like illustrative vision into physical objects i mean like like does that put pressure on you does it make it easier what 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 was that like well ralph's ralph's were um you know george that was already brought to london were were five or six paintings photographs of paintings that ralph had done and quite honestly everything in star wars is in those paintings he's a genius and i'm you know, mm -hmm. you go on the internet, there's no interviews, there's nothing about Ralph. He's like for, forgotten except for fans. So I'm bringing him back. I have, awesome. a, I have a science fiction artist who worked with him very closely and uh, he's got so many stories. So I'm- you got one of his books right here. So. Yeah. Um, um, all these concept arts. Yeah, that Paul Bateman who, who he, he looks after all of his work. The, um, Paul's a good friend of mine. Oh yes, so there you yeah. go. Paul. Yeah. Paul is a lot on camera talking stories yeah. about um, Ralph. So I never met him, unfortunately, um, and I wish I had. But you know, his, his work is now in the Mandalorian. Right. The, the sets that I saw, we didn't use a cantina set. We didn't use is now in the Mandalorian as a bar. I mean, everything that comes from this man's head. So I'm describing with Paul how he worked. The, the day that Ridley called me down to the set, I went down and they gave me a script, said, just read this. But I went next to Ridley's office. There were about eight original Giga paintings around the walls. And I'm just going around and I knew Ridley and I knew, you know, Ridley has a unique eye in this world. Oh. In the most visionary, he's got a head that's a camera. He's just that. And I, I knew what he did because of commercials and what he'd done with the duelist and things. So I just saw these and thought, wow, this is going to be something special. That's awesome. And I worked with Giga a lot. I, the first day oh, I, wow. I went to meet him on the stage and I said, what do you do? What do you need, HR? And he said, bones. I need bones. You right, Mark? There you go. I, I muted him. I'm very excited now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, he said, yeah, what he said before we went on air. So I guess that happened. So I, oh. I, being a set director, I knew where to get bones. They're specially treated because of anthrax. So I got him a whole truckload of bones. We set up a little um, compound in one of the stages for him. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't go in there because of the bones. I mean, I knew. So he sculpted a lot of the alien sculptors in miniature and use small bones and things like that. So um, he was an interesting man. We had lunch every day in the pub with him and his girlfriend, uh, Mia. Mm -hmm. And I and then, had to translate for him. He was going, what is this spotted dick? And I'd say, that, <laughs> that's an English pudding. I've, I've still never had spotted dick. So no. what yeah. is, he would say, what is this toads in the hole? <laughs> 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 I was translating for him. Do you miss the food back home since since you're in Canada? For everyone who doesn't know, he's also in Canada. No, um, I thank God. I you know when I grew up, believe me, Indian restaurants came in. I was in the first Indian little tiny restaurant in London. We were eating there every week. Oh, uh, really? Uh, yeah. British food yeah. at the time. If you right. bought sprouts, they had to be white so that they were good and cooked. It was terrible. What do, what do I see? I see Ray Park always eating Indian food on his uh, Instagram. Yeah. Which did you work? With him at all? I mean, I know yeah. you were on the. the I did a lot of fights. I did a lot of his fights. So um, you were were you chummy with Nick Gillard? Yes. How oh, cool! Yeah, Nick's a mate of mine. Um, no way. And um, George had me do a lot of those fights with Ewan and and um, Darth Maul. In fact, I shot. There was an amazing moment where he jumps and lands off the when he's trying to get on board. Oh, yeah. The, the, on, on Tatooine. And he just lands with the sun behind him. Yes, 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 yes. I had to do that shot. And sheathes his lightsaber. Yeah. yeah. And Annie, Annie Leibovitz wanted to do the same shot at the time. We had a huge fight over who's going to shoot it. And I said, I've right. got to win. I'm doing the movie. And uh, so I worked it out with her. We could both do it. And knowing Ray, 
he's the most brilliant stuntman I've ever worked with. Yeah, and really. uh, I knew he would do it in one take. Otherwise, I would have been finished. But he did. He, he just, I had him, George wanted huge leaps. He was the only one who could do it across canyons and land on his feet doing, I don't know how many somersaults in the air. None of the other stuntmen could do it. George had to put them all in afterwards. Wow. He's brilliant. He was, he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, can, can, can you give us a little insight into the kind of conscious decision to elevate um, the, the fight choreographs? In, in in the prequels to that higher level that became this ballet. And I think really now the core aesthetic of Star Wars is partially defined for me by that fighting style that you get in the prequels that really comes out in The Phantom Menace. Like, what, what was that sort of conscious decision behind the scenes with you guys as you're designing the prequel world of Star Wars in how your philosophy was around the fighting? Basically, because George could do it then, because of the CGI and advancements, he could take characters, change them, do anything he wanted. And um, so you know, George always wrote his films beyond what the technology was at the time. And he, he'd hire people who were young enough to have some experience, but young enough not to be stuck on the old ways. That was everybody. Yeah always by George so those fights grew because he could do it literally he could do much more with it and I think you know as Star Wars progressed then it it became part of you know what once you saw yoga Yoda fighting and um yeah Dooku and then Darth Maul was really the change I think bringing in that that what he had and also because Ray Park is what he's a six Dan stick fighter so he would contribute to huge amounts with uh, Nick because he could do it literally. Yeah. And and the others came up. I mean, Ewan was great at it. Ewan would just practice and practice and get better and better. Yeah. yeah. We saw him in episode three. I mean, him and Anakin. Yeah. Him and Hayden were just. They didn't. Apparently, they didn't even have to slow it down. No. Slow down or speed up the uh, the 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 post process because no, it was just were, so fast. Yeah, they were. By then, it had got you know, to, to a different level. And I, I think, you know, that it needs it. The Star Wars progressed and it needed that the yeah. fights to get that much more advanced. The, the, the role that you had in Return of the Jedi and the Phantom Menace was second unit director. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what the second unit director role is like and, and how it was different from your art director set their decorator role and, and yeah. uh, George, so George, commissioned I, when i finished in life of brown i thought that's it i gotta start directing now I, it's, it's time has come if i don't i'll never and i was offered conan to co-direct with ron cobb and um i turned it down and george commissioned my short film the uh, black angel that i'd written as my debut george commissioned that so then he kicked me off as a director and um I was waiting for the, my first feature, The Sender, to go, and they called me, George called me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm waiting for The Sender to trigger. And he said, well, can you come and take over here? He was directing the second unit. So you have two directors working side by side on these movies. And because um, he wanted to spend more time with Richard Marquand on the, mm. he felt he needed to keep what his vision was always, because it's always hard if another director's doing what you want. So he said, can you just come and take over? So, I mean, yeah, I, I turned up and my first job was a massive battle scene on three levels with stuntmen and <laughs> engines from ships smashing through windows. It was huge. But I got to shoot um, Harrison Ford when he came out of the carbon. Wow. Oh, awesome. That they couldn't fit it into the schedule so i knew harrison anyway so i filmed that i filmed then george put me on ewoks right. and I got <laughs> 10 days of ewoks so i was bossing warwick davis around I, yeah I, I loved that guy. <laughs> and i said it was me telling you to do somersaults and do all of this stuff because he was young and i would plead with george i said please can i stop can i <laughs> <laughs> 
no, no, I love what you're doing. Do more partying. We have babies dancing. And oh, so you did the final scene. That's I think that's, yeah. that's one of my favorite scenes. I have two favorite scenes in Star Wars. Yeah. The scene where Anakin blasts off to go to save his mother. Right. And then the scene at the the celebration on the yeah. forest moon of Endor. That was such a. And then the the song that they added in in the the VHS <laughs> yeah. special edition was beautiful. So I'm doing all that dancing of Ewoks dancing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jim Henson with little babies in nests dancing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was the more I did, George was loving it. He just said, "No, do more. Get this. Do that." Oh my God, this is crazy. That's awesome. I didn't know. From Phantom Menace, by then, I mean, I was a lot more experienced, and um, they, I'd kind of put my name down because they didn't think they needed second unit and. Knowing mm -hmm. George, and he doesn't like shooting. He doesn't like being away from home. And they, they were doing this massive movie in 12 weeks. And I said to 12 Rick weeks. McCullen, yeah, the, I said to Rick McCullough, the producer, you, you're in denial. And they phoned me up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm in Vancouver. I was doing the mastering on some color. And they said, can you come and take over? So I went. And um, George always says, in a way, he divided that I got to shoot with everybody, all the main actors, everything. And in fact, at the end, George had to go because of the timing on, on the ILM. And I finished the last, I think, seven to 10 days of the movie. Oh, wow. Alone, the, As yeah. the sole director, you were yeah. pretty much lead, leading the director wow. in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a lot of the pod race stuff. I, you know, it, it no way. So you, 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 <laughs> you did some of my like that pod i was nine years old when the phantom menace came out and, and that pod race scene i love cars i love engines is it true that you guys got sound from the pod race uh, uh from george's ferrari that i don't know <laughs> ben Burt would probably ben Burt used anything you could get yeah ben. okay so uh, george loves fast cars and ferrari so i'm sure it was yes because um, Ben would record anything, pigs, dogs, bears, whatever he could find that would make a noise, he was on it and changing it a bit. What, what were some of the processes that went into filming that pod race scene? It was endless. You know, and it, it, it's when you look at some of the photographs, right as we started, there was one of Tunisia's, I remember being in the hotel at night, all the windows blew in, everyone was shrieking and frightened. And we'd been through it on the first one. So I knew we drove out at dawn mm -hmm. to a wreck all those pods were f uh, lying on the ground, every tent was gone. And there were makeup people scrambling about in the mud saying, oh, I found Ewan's beard or I found uh, Quigley's <laughs> beard. And, but, you know, we, we were shooting again that afternoon. But, um, yeah, to me, the pod race is worth the price of admission. <laughs> I agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. And I got to shoot huge amounts of Jar Jar Binks. I got – and George oh, – cool. yeah, frustrated yes. with robots and and with r2d2 especially so he said i'm giving you all of r2d2 scenes <laughs> you've got more patience than me let um, me so let me play a, a little short clip just an homage of uh it's working! <laughs> so, um, so one quick question because you just mentioned something that i think is probably the most important thing about the phantom menace which is that it introduces to the world of cinema the first truly actualized three-dimensional CGI character in, in, in Jar Jar Binks, uh, which now everybody you know sees that as commonplace with with you know uh, you know uh, yes. all the characters in the Marvel movies, etc. But Jar Jar was really the first one of its kind. What what was it like during the shooting? Um, in terms of having to take that mental leap between a med best and his sort of uh, costume and what it would actually be like in in the final product and and were there any kind of learning curves that you guys had to go through for that? Yeah, because Ahmed's very tall and I mean I did nearly all of his stuff uh, um, with Jaja, a lot of his background stuff. so, He's very tall, but he's so expressive as an actor that for me, I just was Jar Jar, you know, and the head was pretty interesting and, you know, sitting right up on top of his head like that. But often you have a little kid and you have a very tall actor. We had to um, 
make sure he was framed and how it would work. But having ILM on the stage, then it made it a lot easier because they could visualize for us. But also you're forgetting Watto. Watto is mm. oh, yeah. an incredible character. No one's ever questioned or no one's ever asked it, but he was an actor with a head on hat on his head on the stage too. And only money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, tell, yeah, tell us about Watto, man. That's yeah. awesome. Watto's Watto's an interesting guy. Yeah, and he's an incredible character. And really, when you think of it, those two, they broke cinema um, boundary yeah. completely. And, and you know, I know because George wanted to start his digital studio next to the ranch. He got all the land there, and the, and the locals blocked him from building it. And really, that's the forerunner to the Mandalorian now, what they're doing. That's what George envisaged to come. Mm. Yeah, there he is with his tin hat on like a Chinese food. <laughs> and again, wow, so these actors are so good. They were performing. They weren't just standing there. They were actually performing, and uh, it, it makes it a lot easier. So so wait a minute. When you guys were shooting actual takes, yeah, the, the guy playing Waddle was wearing that that little yeah. outfit with the watch and the and the yeah. hat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I shot one of those scenes, and I think it was that one you just put up with, with, because um, I was in that, and I had to do, um, I had to do, Qui Gon when um, he got onto a uh, creature, and we had four grips and a and a blue, kind of, um, uh, it was like a saddle, so I had mm -hmm. to get, I had to get Liam onto that. And, shoot him off That's but i was there on this set doing some of this stuff and yeah so both both ahmed and um him were both acting it out everything i did and he was acting the voice of jar jar all the time so it you know it's quite easy for me because you're just going into what he's going to be and i knew what he was going to be because we had john noel on the floor all the time and they were showing the stuff and to take this into a more kind of humbling place, and it's not something that I agree with, even though at the time I had my own issues with it, what what was it like emotionally working on this film and then getting so much backlash after it released on the Jar Jar character when he was such an important moment in cinema? Um, and, you know, now we recognize that 25, 30 really? years later. But at the time, there was nothing but backlash and thank god twitter wasn't around back then you oh, know? No, <laughs> yeah yeah no thank god you know it's it's so um it, george told me himself i make my movies for nine-year-old kids it's not my fault that adults like them mm. and so if you asked and i did after that relentlessly anybody of seven to twelve what's your favorite character jar jar yeah because he steps in poo you know he does stupid things <laughs> which is what, <laughs> what they loved and he kind of lightened it all up and then and george being called a racist was so absurd and far from it and i, I talked to george about it afterwards and he said you know I never read reviews. I don't even look. You feel your ego's fluffed. If it's good, if it's bad, you don't. And he said, I just got to get on with the work. That's all. And finally, for, you know, I felt so bad because I became friends with Ahmed and he's a very cool, wonderful man. And uh, to get this backlash was, and, and I always gauge people like that because there comes the adult kind of, dismissive of something when George just loves those silent movies, you know, Buster Keaton and these, and that's who he is. He's Buster Keaton brought back. And I think it's finally being realized, you know, there was a lot about, I don't know whether it's because George came back and whether he's directing or whatever was coming at him. But when you, as I said, you look at the pod race, you look at, Darth Maul, you look at elements in this film and it's Ian McDermott, his like like Samuel Jackson said, he didn't even know he was playing both characters until he saw the movie in yeah. the theater. Yeah. And you know, and it had Samuel Jackson. How cool can you get? I mean, come yeah. on, you yeah. know, with, with the odor. <laughs> yeah. It was I just, you know, I, I had to do one of the scenes in there as well. And I mean, it's like 
I don't know. I just couldn't Yoda? understand it. And it's a film for kids. He really wanted to cement Star Wars is what the audience is for. And kids love that movie. Yeah. yeah I, I, I was older when, when Phantom Menace came out in 1999. So I was already, you know, past college into my professional career. And I had things that, you know, I reacted negatively to that, since then, I've kind of gotten over and respected right. for what it is. Um, but, you know, another thing that now I look back on and it's just kind of shameful is also the treatment of Jake Lloyd, right? So it was a mad best, got a lot of slack, and so did Jake Lloyd. Uh, what was it like working with Jake? And in the years that followed, did you see any kind of consequences of that that maybe aren't so nice? Yes. Yeah, I did. Um, with Jake, he was my son was then um, seventeen um, in London with me. My elder son. So he, he and my daughter got jobs on the film. They just come and they get jobs, and they were working. Oh. And Jake took my son as his elder brother. He had to go everywhere with him. So I got to know them, and he had very balanced parents. They were they were not at all starstruck. They weren't at all like pushing the kid. They were very careful with him. So everything was done correctly with Jake. Um, and he personifies that kind of look that he should have. That's how George, you know, told him. And I, he did very well as a young actor, I think. And, you know, it was a lot of work. I was, um, I, I went to the um, celebration in um, Atlanta, and I guess about nine years ago, um, we we're all signing autographs. And I saw him, and I'd read about what had happened. He was on his own. They hadn't put him with all of us signing autographs. He was on his own at the back with very minor people. So I went over and said, hey, Jake, can I introduce myself back to him again? And I said, you remember Thomas? And he said, oh, yes, I did. And he was a very troubled young man. I could see that. And I felt very bad. I was the only one who went to chat to him and speak to him. Nobody else bothered. Mm. And there he is on his own, like isolated. Um, and I think, you know, kids are pretty relentless in their – it's bullying at the end of the day when you when you work it out. And I think for him – there was a massive jealousy that comes out and all sorts yeah. of things against him. And, um, yeah, it's very sad. You know, he ended up with a lot of mental problems and all sorts of things. He's the, really the only one out of that whole Star Wars universe who's really suffered so badly from this. And, and that, I think, was being a young man, you know, at school. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, like, look, I... That's why in my productions, I always steered away from using uh, minors in my productions because it's it's a difficult it's a difficult thing oh, yeah. <laughs> to ask to ask of a young human to take all this pressure to be so public, you know. Yeah. And then, like, you know, there there is something about being eighteen and being able to make your own decisions. Um, being a minor is tough, you know, and getting thrown yeah. into that. It's a no-win situation, perhaps, you know? Um, and yeah. it's a shame because I always kind of liked, you know, Jake Lloyd's, you know, performance. Me too. There's nothing yeah. great. He was supposed to be this, you know, aloof young boy who had a pure heart of gold and, yes. uh, you know, had the grandiose dreams of becoming this laser sword-wielding knight of the of the stars. Exactly, yeah, and a pod it's, racer, you know, he was like yeah, a cool kid who could actually beat an evil enemy. and Because uh, he's so powerful, I mean, it, yeah. it, and, and I think George picked right when he cast Jake, and yeah, because, I mean, it just shows that stark contrast between him and then Anakin later on. And, yes. I mean, I was exactly. the same age as Jake, I was nine when episode uh, one came, or maybe I'm a year younger. I got bullied for liking Star Wars. I can't imagine what he must have gone through, you know? <laughs> I've had a lot of arguments about it, but... Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's a great movie. It is. It's it's one of my favorites. I remember when I went to Celebration Chicago, uh, that there was a 20th anniversary of The Phantom Menace there, and there was a little um, video that was displayed on screen for everybody with George. And he was saying... Just a quick, you know, before everything started, he's like, if you're here, you know, you love The Phantom Menace and I love you guys and I appreciate you. And 
I just want to say thank you for liking the movie and uh, you know, happy 20th anniversary. And it was right. it was so beautiful and it was so nice that someone who creates a story is still caring about his fans and still yes. very involved with everybody who he's touched throughout the world with his movies. Um, no other film's done this. Nothing else has gone. No, I mean, it's Star Wars. Yeah. What was it like? Um, have you kept in touch with George at all? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. He hasn't changed. I took my, my wife now to the ranch. Um, it was a few years ago. I was doing some work up there oh, on Black Angel, and um, we, we it got re-released, and I redid the sound, and then I went. He was showing me that he was digitizing the... the <laughs> the six movies for a release and he said come and look at this because with film you get away with it he was like on darth vader you could see all the gaffer tape and <laughs> all the tape. everything showed up he had to redo the entire effects on on all six movies and then we had lunch you know and we had a long lunch talking because he he'd got um he'd got um his daughter who was i think eight months so most of the lunch was talking about, he was telling me about different baby foods that were really ingenious now and nappies that you didn't have to stick your finger in to see if they peed, they would change color. I mean, that, you know, that's George. We talked about life. Normal and, stuff, yeah. But he did say to me um, then walking back, he said, you know, I, I really miss John Barry and John designed um, um, Star Wars. And, it, and he, he told Rick in front of, me he said you know there were only five people stood by my side on star wars and that was john and les and roger nobody else did and yeah. they, he since told it to christopher nolan and we did we were friends and we we were with us on the same page of making it john barry you know died he, he went on to do second unit on um empire strikes back and he uh died of meningitis it just it threw him in a day and it's a huge loss to our industry. And he was a rock for George, absolute rock. He was a genius as a designer and a friend. And it, it, it's, it's, it, it shows how much it meant to George for him just to stop and say, you know, I really miss John. Mm. Because he doesn't normally emotionally say stuff like that. Yeah. So yeah, no, we were, we were chatting about all sorts of stuff, microscopic That's worlds, also, yes, that's which, that's the, that's 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 where that's where I was. Gonna let's, go take with it. It. Let's, let's take it. Let's take it. I mean, we're, so, we're we're getting close to to your time here, so I mean, we want to be respectful of it. But Mark, yeah, go go for it, man. Yeah. So so look, our holy grail, our ark of the covenant, to use an appropriate George Lucas thing, is what his vision was for seven, eight, nine. Because as a fan, you know, and I've said this many many times over many many years of doing this show. I feel robbed that we never actually got to see <laughs> yeah, what 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 his vision was for seven eight nine. Um, regardless of whether I agree with it or not, that's irrelevant, right? I, it's it's what his vision for seven eight nine was. Did you guys ever have those little chats where he would hint at you the parameters, the alchemy of seven eight nine? No, um, I, I did talk about some things with him about different worlds and stuff, but. For sure, George, George is so respectful of the hero's journey and so studied um, of Joseph Campbell that he was going to bring that to bear and, and Luke would have obviously ended with Ray. I mean, you know, the, he, when you look at that first Ralph Macquarie painting of Luke standing on the bluff, that's actually a woman. He actually had a girl playing the lead at that point. Right. And then Kira or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it it kind of came back to that. Um, and I think he would have had an apprentice like Ray come and take over. Um, but he would never have been as disrespectful of... <laughs> the force and i have to be careful <laughs> what i'm saying is this second one i think jj did a masterful job he at least brought it back to what the fans wanted um and needed after all that time and, and managed to do the best he could um i think george might have 
gone into there's there's worlds that i think he put easter eggs in that um i'm going to discuss in this documentary and bring out okay um but i think i think yeah i i think he would you know james cameron said when you look at the first six movies of star wars there's more invention more pushing the envelope in those movies and that kind of stopped so jj had to do what he had to do he had to bring it back and, and for the fans um and i think he tried to knit it up but george would never have done that he would never have restricted himself he would have gone on and that's what the fans really wanted and you know why are fans in droves worshiping mandalorian right yeah. and it pushes uh, technology yeah and i'm interviewing gareth edwards yeah he, wow. he's the one i chose to be give me his take on star wars the first one and seeing it because i think rogue one is the most like a george lucas movie i agree i agree and he's the one who got more bashed by anybody <laughs> yeah with <laughs> with wrongfully with, so yes with tarkin specifically i thought when i was watching that movie the tarkin really made me question reality yes i was like what am i watching is this like footage from back then that like yeah like that 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 was recorded but never used and then re uh, like my yeah. brain exploded yeah and i was like that's that's the george lucas yeah. philosophy at play right like exactly. yeah that that the story and, and the filmmaking process is great but the movie itself also has a responsibility to the to advancing the medium forward exactly that's exactly it and that's what is genius to me you know i i think um as I said, and he's always done that. I noticed he employed people younger who would never go, oh, we don't do it like that. Oh, we've always done it like this. No. Yeah. He got people on, didn't tell them what to do, but knew that they would somehow reinvent the wheel each time, and they did. And, and I think that's the same with the characters and everything, and that's why it's communicated deep inside the entire world. You can go to China, there'll be a Star Wars doll or a model in, in a village. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's unique, and it's needed. To me, he, he created the perfect myth. Yeah. And children need it. Children need to watch this stuff. Um, growing up so you know the last line in my book is do not let anyone tell you you can't you can yeah yeah i end the book because that's partly why i wrote it as a kind of mentorship you know we never said you can't do that we just somehow found a way to do it all and um that's what I, i'm kind of most proud of that we actually you know it's for kids yeah yeah and they need it we all need it and we're all and everyone argues episode three was was dark and grim and violent but hey i saw it when i was i think 13 or 14 uh yeah. it turned out okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> i loved it it was good but but all heroes journeys are essentially made for kids because yes they're they they are the the kind of proverbial bat mitzvah or com or, or first communion or you know like you know in spanish culture there's the quinceanera and like yes. there's all these rites of passages of be of evolving from child to adult right to young adult and that's what star wars is about right it's like yes. those tough choices that you have to make when yes. you start to grow up and knowing the path of i'm going to take my life in a good way or in a bad way right and like that's why even the dark movies like revenge of the sith i think are for kids as well right yes these the the sequels, I think, were made for a completely different psychographic, for older money. people, for yeah. money, yes. for fan service, for nostalgia, for everything except what the tenets of the original brand pillars of Star Wars were, in my opinion. But yeah, anyway. no, you're right. You're absolutely correct. And I mean, you know, the, and, and all of these stories, they're like Buddhist tales. They're very simple, funny tales on the surface. But underneath, there's deep connecting to us of these choices, you know, and very often everybody around you saying, no, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You've got to do this. And you're going, no, this is what my instinct is telling me. And it's, those are how kids learn the confidence to trust their own instinct and to act on it as well. It's the toughest thing ever that, you know, I'm sure you went through it. I went through it. We all do. And George, 
keyed into that. And that's, you know, Joseph Campbell was a, was a huge influence on George on how to tell a simple story on the surface, a fun ride, but the key is buried in exactly the right moments, you know, where you know, Luke's a simple farm boy. When you look at it, he's got to choose, am I going to go off and be fighting in these fighters up there and fighting a rebellion? Or oh, it's easier, no, just to stay a farm boy. Yeah, and like, you know, Joseph Campbell, and I've obviously, I mean, I've read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and I'm obsessed with that literature as well. And Joseph Campbell's whole thing can be kind of boiled down to that one saying that he yeah. used to always use, follow your bliss, you know, yeah. like, like what, what, where does your bliss take you, you know? Yeah. And uh, it definitely doesn't take you to where the corporate overlords are forcing you to go, right? That, <laughs> no. that, 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 that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, all right. So before I stop here, I gotta, I gotta pry one more time. Right. When you, when you say microscopic worlds, are you talking about characters that were actually interacting at this scale? I think or that probably uh, could be. There's a very interesting world there. I, I just take from George doing such a strong exclamation explanation of the midi chlorians, mm. and I think that would have been expanded. That's what I think. Cool. I think that's an Easter egg. That's what I love, but I was with one. Everyone, you know, talked garbage about it, but I, I thought it was really cool and it explains yeah. the force uh, yeah. more in depth. When, when yeah. is your documentary coming out? The one that you're working on? Oh, we're we're final editing now. I've shot hundreds of hours of stuff, and, and it, oh wow! Well, it, it the reason David West Reynolds. I don't know if you know David. He's the David was an archaeologist. And he was in Egypt, and a huge Star Wars fan. He was in Egypt on a site, and he suddenly thought, you know, all these places where Star Wars shot should be like archaeological treasures for people. So <laughs> he called Lucasfilm. No records had been kept because nobody thought anything of this first movie. It wouldn't even go out. So they didn't, there were no records. And he said, What do you mean? And I said, No, we, nobody can tell us. Robert Watts, who was the production head then, said, I remember going out of Tozer, you turned left into the shop. That was it. And that's, that's like hundreds of thousands of miles of desert wastelands. So um, he took his own crew and he went back and shot and found every single, we're matching the film, he found every single, not only the locations, but the camera angles, everything. When wow. Rick McCallum took over producing um, Phantom Menace, he then said, well, I've got to go back. We go, and nobody knew where to go. And he just remembered, he said, didn't some kid call in and say, ask him about these locations, get him on the phone. So he flew David to Tunisia. David had to go around showing the designers, everybody, where everything was shot. Where Tatooine yeah. was in the real world. Yeah. That's so awesome. Rick, we got to ask him about that, Mark. We're, we're going to be talking with Rick in a, a few weeks here. Hopefully, yeah. So. Well, he'll tell you about that. So then he said to David, why don't you um, come back to the ranch? And David said, well, I'm in Arcadillo. So what will I do? And Rick said, we'll find something. Come. David ended up writing all of those, the Star Wars Dictionary, all of those masterful books on the star wars world of how all the props were made the sets everything he wrote about 12 new york times best-selling books for star wars wow so he i was at the um, ranch for the picnic on phantom menace there was always a, a yearly ranch and do a picnic in july cool I there i was actually chatting because i knew coppola because i had a deal with his studio and George and down comes David West Reynolds and said, Oh, I've got to talk to you. He starts asking me all these questions and I'm answering them. And he said, Roger, I don't care. You've got to write a book. It's him who did all of this. No one else knows this stuff. And he's opening in, in my documentary saying, you know, when I did all of this, I kept wondering who are these people who made these things? There's nothing, not one of the making ofs has John Barry or I, even what we did in it. It skips mm. throughout that because no one else knew. Right. So I'm the only one who knew. So it was David's fault that I wrote Cinema Alchemy. I had to take a year off and write. <laughs> right. So now I've got all his footage going back in 1995 with him and I, him with 
I had to use green screen because he's in America and we can't travel at the moment, but I'm in right. a mixing theatre with a huge screen and we're showing his work and we're both discussing what we did, what I did on location and how we did it all. So David's a major part of this um, documentary. And um, he, he's, a, he's the ultimate nerd, a geek <laughs> of Star Wars. I mean, he just knows that, you know, he's the one who did a cut out of my lightsaber and how it actually worked. He, right. Oh, wow. He, with everything like that, they're all in the Star Wars. If you look him up, David West Reynolds, it, you'll suddenly go, oh, wow. Do you know, do you know where that original lightsaber actually is? Do you have tracking of it? The one that was used? On no, the, the one that I handmade are the ones that loop used that was given to him in by obi-wan kenobi and was in um the the ball training ball yeah, yeah. that's the only real two scenes it's used in the first one so those i've got the original um i've got an original graphlex because at the end 33 were bought special effects had loads of them i got i got five of them myself and then another couple mm -hmm. So I've got the only one that's exactly as it was. I mean, and we got to end like that. Hey, well, like I get condemned for it. People are saying, oh, it wasn't like that because they find, I, I've got people yelling at me saying there was only ever one made. And I said, no, I made one. I made a small <laughs> one in my office. <laughs> I it blue, and then I made a third one and I gave it to the special effects boys to drill out to put in the thing on it. Right. No, no, there was only one. No, I made it. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. I, I said I Do, made the thing. Can so. you can you can you grab it or is it locked away in like a, Yo, in a you lock box? I don't think it's here because I think. Hang on. All right, all right, no worries. All right, well, <laughs> yeah, stand by, everybody. <laughs> stand by. <laughs> you might be in luck because everything. Oh, you, you're in luck. I, I, oh, oh boy, God. here we go. You're filming. We go. Oh no. We're filming everything in the um, in the um, edit rooms. We've got turntables and stuff, so we're doing so. That's that's ah! wow! Look at that! Look at that! So that's, that's a real. So I didn't like the bubble strip. I didn't like the clip when it clipped onto the graphics camera. So this was a lock. It just fitted, and I, I I put these around to make a handle, and on this I I got chrome tape, which I I can't. I don't want to put on now because it looks like chrome tape, but on film it didn't show up. But I just hid the Graflex name. That's incredible. So that's circa 1977. Uh, parts of it, yes. Yeah, that's amazing. That is truly amazing. That is a relic. That is truly a relic <laughs> of, like you said, the greatest modern day myth, right? I mean, that is yes. the, you know, that is, you know, you know, the, the icon. And at the end of Star Wars, see, I adapted real guns, so nothing was kept. They all went back to Baptist, the gun hire place, and stripped down again. So they made – it's interesting because Gareth is telling this story by when he they laid out all the guns when he was starting Rogue One. And he was going, oh, yeah, well, oh, okay. Uh, or this, See, this doesn't look very science fiction-like, and he picked up one. And the guy was going, yeah, yeah. And he, and then he said, that's actually the one that was used on A New Hope that Roger made. <laughs> and it then got him thinking. And then he's giving me a whole explanation about how changing things a little bit and how this world was not sci-fi world. I tried to make a real world that people would identify with. And I think that's half a lot of the reason why Star Wars connected to people for the first time. Before that, what was it, Barbarella? There was yeah, yeah. Gordon. Everything was over-designed, unbelievable stuff. 2001 was really the only well-respected kind of yeah. ubiquitous sci-fi movie before that. You know, yeah. like, I mean, you know, like, yeah, because there was no Star Trek movies yet, right? It was only no. a television show. Yeah, um, no super, you know, nothing. What it... it it's funny because one of the critiques that I remember from 1999 when The Phantom Menace came out was that everything seemed too new where Star Wars, everything was old and oily. Yes. And that people didn't like that everything was so polished um, in The Phantom Menace. But that was by design, uh, of course, right? 
that was George's design, yeah. And I, I think because he could now do it, you know, with with um, when you look at um, uh, James Cameron's um, uh, Terminator, mm. it was now possible to do that kind of world. So he kind of changed it up and kind of went that way. I still yeah. prefer the use grungy look, you know, I do. And I, you know, I like, and people have always said to me, we loved your alien because they were half it, drunk coffee cups and bits of stuff around it. But that's right. how it is. You know, you look at the Apollo when they were going up into space, they're crammed and, and full of stuff that they use. That's how life is to me. And yeah, that's how you connect to people. Not when it goes all fantasy, you don't, you're looking at it with a different perspective. So, so look, we've taken up an hour of your time. You've been so generous with us. Let's put the book back up. Um, Cinema Alchemist Designing Star Wars and Alien, and a memoir by Roger Christian. Go to check it out. Uh, you can download it on Amazon. There's a Kindle link also, so you can get it on the Kindle. Um, you know, I'm sure that we've just touched the, uh, you know, the tip of the yeah. iceberg of some There's of these stories. A lot of stories. And everything else in, is in there. So, yeah. guys, please go check it out. Support this amazing man and uh, learn a lot of things that uh, you probably have questions about. Yeah, yeah, and like I, did, I had to do the blow by blow account of making Alien as well because that was never covered at the time. So there's a lot of cool stories about that. <laughs> so, so is Alien connected to Blade Runner? Well, it's connected by Ridley Scott. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Of course, it's connected like that. But, yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's. It, that film, the Ridley verse. The Ridley I, I, was, I was in LA when that film came out, and it was so condemned. The head of Paramount, I brought it up to the head of Paramount who I was working for, and he said, Yeah, that film proves that Ridley Scott can't direct actors. <laughs> and wow. I one day I gave up, I was so angry in the cutting rooms, and I gave up with my editor and said, Come on, let's go and see. We had to go downtown. The film broke, uh, and I hand wrote a uh, note to Ridley like this in anger it was in huge letters because he'd gone to Mexico he didn't know what he'd done wrong and I said to him you know screw them all Ridley you've made a masterpiece don't listen to anybody yeah it's just masterpiece after masterpiece my personal favorite gladiator um, but it's just like the man has done so many incredible films yes and it's it's truly astonishing yeah like how good he is it's yes. just you know incredible no, it, incredible it, it, stuff he should be respected even more for what he's done in cinema. I mean, it's, it's you know, equally to George Lucas, he's been a revolutionary of, really kind of puts our dreams and nightmares right up on the screen for us mm -hmm. to watch, you know? Yeah, yeah. When you look at Blade Runner, I mean, it's just, and it's been copied by everybody. I was lucky, I was, I was doing, directing commercials for Boss Film, at the time when they were shooting the uh, um, the miniatures and the huge city for Alien, it was in one of the stages at Boss Film in um, Santa Monica. So I used to go down and watch, and I was going, "Wow, this is going to be amazing." That's awesome. Well, now they just keep making more and more Alien vs Predator, and yeah, it it keeps expanding. It does, but that yeah. first film is loved. It's like the first Star Wars. There's something that is. I don't know. There's something earthly connected to us in both those films. I think the simplicity of Alien. When you read the script, it's just you just read it. There it is. Yeah, I feel like movies are too complicated now. Almost yeah. they rely more on special effects than just a straight much, story. Yeah, much so. Yeah. Well, anyways, Roger. Uh, All right. We really appreciate your time. This was a real treat for me and Mark, and I know everyone else watching. So. Uh, once again, you guys can go grab his book. I've linked it down below in the description. And thank you for watching. We will see you all next yeah. time. Yeah, email me a link if you have a link. The yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll email you a link. And also, before we go here, because um, I the, we uh, keep the discussion going on StarWarsTheory.com. We go over there, and uh, we have a lot of fun with the community. Thank you so much for all the support that you've given us over there. Um, I'll definitely send you the link, Roger, okay. and. 
I can't wait to see that documentary. I'm very excited about that. So keep us posted with that. And maybe when the documentary comes out, you can come back on the show. Yeah, yeah. We can do. Like you can do, promote it. Yeah. Yeah. We can I'd do. We can do. We can do, we can do round do. Trying to do some cool things with it rather than just talking heads. Although it's me telling stories the whole time, but we've got interesting. That's stuff. what we're here for. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, also uh, the, the Rule of Two podcast interviews with Paul Hirsch and Bill Kimberlin and Roger Christian and everybody we've had we've on the show. We've on Spotify. They're down yeah. below. Link yeah. Them. Yep. Spotify link down below and, you know, let's roll. And, and book link down below and we'll see you guys later. Yeah.